Uh, I want to welcome everyone back to Risk. Uh, tonight we have uneducated economists with us, as well as uh, my friend James. Uh, we're going to be talking about a variety of things. So let's get right into it. Let's talk a little bit about like, you know, the other day when, um, because a lot of people were asking me about that whole like, the price of housing controlling the population of, of, you know, of the people out there. And, you know, where I really, where I got that from was uh, reading this essay, this Cantillon essay um, from back in like the 1700s. And part of that essay was talking about how the property owners could control the amount of people who lived on the property by the desires and wants of the property owners. So that really got me thinking about like, Okay, so if you were able to create an environment that was just not conducive to having families, then people simply just wouldn't have families or they would have less families or less desire to start families. And one of those things that I see taking place is the price of homes. And now I read an article over in China just recently how they want to start dealing with the irrational exuberance that has taken place to the property prices. And one of the reasons they want to do that is because they want to start encouraging families again, like the started starting of families to basically deal with their reduction of population. That's going to be, uh, from what I understand, is going to be getting out of control before too long. So when you think about like what it is that society can do to try and control the population out there, if you can keep people from buying homes, then you might discourage them from wanting to start families. But that wasn't the only thing that I had just recently saw, because I, I don't know if you caught the video that I did just recently. I seen where women are now getting degrees at a higher rate than men are. Mm -hmm. And now something that the article that I had read was talking about was is that this is going to create a mating crisis. And this is kind of reasonable to think about as women would really ten have a tendency to try and find somebody to basically partner up with for life who is going to be a provider of something more than what they could do. I mean, this has kind of like been the traditional thought. Now it's not necessarily that's the way all women think, but it certainly has been like kind of the traditional thought for as long as I can look back into history, this is the way it's always been. So if women can get degrees at a higher rate than men, then you might actually discourage women from wanting to start families in general together. So these things are really starting to take place when you look at them, you know, happening in society here. You know, I, I don't know if you caught the video that uh, George Gammon did with Rollo Tomasi, but they talked a lot about her hypergamy and how that yeah. factors into this. So it's yeah. a very interesting thought experiment. It, it, it really is, you know, to think that if you can, you know, if there is, you know, just exactly that, like, you know, if you can't up, up, your, up your lifestyle by marriage, then you may not have any intentions on ever doing it. You know, it's, it's, really it's interesting funny thing. because, uh, you know, I, I have to tend to agree with you. You know, women have a tendency of, of wanting to uh, to be with somebody at least uh, uh, in the same same uh, socioeconomic platform or higher, whereas men don't necessarily, uh, you know, look in that direction. You know, they so I, I think, you know, you're uh, you know, you're looking at something that's going to be a very, very big factor going forward um, economically and and socially and you know I mean it's gonna have all kinds of all kinds of ramifications uh, you know on, uh, on on so many different levels it really does and then you know you think about like you know part of I don't know what made me I just kind of jump around in my thoughts a lot of times but part of this essay was uh, he talked about wealth Cantillon did and he talked about wealth being three one basically being three things. It's food, conveniences, and pleasures of life. And I think about what it is that people are really striving for when they get married and they have kids and they have these families, you know, they're trying to acquire this wealth, these food, conveniences, pleasures of life. And this is how they feel that they are getting it is by, you know, pursuing this like American dream with this home and this family. But then in reality, you look at what it is that is provided for the younger crowd today. I mean, like you think about it, when I was a kid, I was like, I was adamant. When I turned 16, I wanted a driver's license. Like I ran down and got me a driver's license because I lived out in the country. If you didn't have a car, you were like, you're stuck out in the middle of nowhere, man. I mean, I had a beat up old Carmen Ghia and I just ripped that thing all over the country, right? So anyway, I- well, Those I, were the old cars too, Carmen Ghias. 
it was fun, man. And but now with rideshare and the conveniences that are allotted to people, like I don't even like see the point of like why would a millennial like a younger generation even want a car like you know their liabilities they're expensive and you really don't need them all the time so the conveniences are being provided for them and i thought to myself wow they're giving these people wealth they're not even like they don't have to strive for it food conveniences pleasures of life right all you have to it's being provided you don't have to strive for anything and that to me is a very dangerous place to be you know when you're hungry you try it was amazing. Like, I, I don't know what made me just pop this story into my head, but I remember one time, like I had my, my house payment was due and like, I had a $1,200 house payment. It was a week before it was due and I had absolutely no money. I had no idea how I was going to get this thing done. And so I'm calling like every single contractor I can think of looking for work. And one of the guys says, Hey man, my mom has this single wide trailer and she wants a new roof on it. Now, not just like a new roof, like tear the thing off. So like it's open to the sky and frame a new roof and put it on there. And I'm like five days. So I call up my buddy and I'm like, dude, we are going to blast this thing out because I need money in five days. And damn, if we didn't do it, I mean, we tore this thing completely off, re-roofed it and had it done in five wow. days and by check. Right. And I thought, holy crap. And the guy says, how did you do that? And I said, I'm hungry. <laughs> I am like I have. I am desperate, and I don't know what I was going to do. I had to happen. It was really got that work too, right? Yeah, and I got the work. It was just hard enough finding the work, and then you had to do it. So, you know, being able to like cutting it that close was very difficult. I don't know how many people out there have that kind of like, you know, go get it, you know, kind of thing. Now, to be honest with you, I was scared to death at the time and I was fortunate to do it. And I look back and I think, man, that was so cool that I was able to happen. But yeah, that was difficult and it was difficult times. And it was something that I had to live through for years, you know, trying to live like that and just make it until I finally failed. <laughs> so. hey, we all go through that. So, so I would imagine something like UBI is just going to kill that drive in most people. Yeah, I can't imagine why... Why would, why would you, I mean, you know, I hear now even people talking about like, they don't want to mess up like their social security because if they work more than 20 hours or something, and I'm like, well, what if you got a job that paid way more than all that? Yeah. You know, would you, would you go back to work? You know? And they're like, nah, it's much easier not work. And you know, and it's just like, of course it is. But UBI, it, it will, like a lot of people will argue with that, that you can get this basic standard of living. It is. And what it's going to do is it's going to raise the standard of living to the point that the UBI really is no longer an efficient way of living it's just won't we won't make the won't cut it you know i see people out here you know walking walking this river walk who are homeless but yet they have ebt cards it doesn't mean that you know life is any better i mean they have wealth coming to them but it doesn't provide them with like the wealth they need to get out and achieve that american dream of a house and car and stuff like keep that. Them here instead of moving off right that's exactly right it, it will it's it kind of it kind of enforces a powerful power creates more power for the magnet. I don't know. It just keeps you there. Like it, it yeah. does. It disincentifies. The general rhetoric that we hear is, you know, that they they want to institute. You know, you you won't own anything, and you're going to you're going to be happy. So if they keep everybody on that, you know, on that level where everybody generally doesn't own, you know, uh, and and you know you're you're living and you're able to. You know, you're able to, to Uber or, or whatever the case may be. You know, you don't own a car, you don't own a home, but, you know, everybody is doing it. Then, you know, they can keep everybody pacified. And, you know, uh, I would assume, you know, that the, the disparity is going to become even greater between, you know, whomever, whether it's the Davos crowd and us. Government. Yeah. Well, you know, it's going to be much easier to control the population once you have them under your thumb in such manners, you know. I mean, one of the things that when I was failing, I didn't take the handouts. Like, I didn't go and get food stamps or ask for anything. Like, if I couldn't, if I couldn't do it, then I couldn't do it. I mean, that was just all there was to it. And I look back on it and it was just like, man, I shouldn't have been so proud. Right. I mean, I should have I should have taken some of the handouts. Maybe I wouldn't have lost the house or whatever. But I, I just feel in the condition that I was in that all I would have been doing was basically 
enabling myself to to stay in the in the in the rut that I was in. I mean, drinking heavily, being depressed, whatever. I mean, I just felt that that would just carry it on. I mean, something inside me said that, you know, you got to change your ways and that, you know, if you take these handouts, you're just going to continue on with what you're doing. And I, I, something inside me just knew it. And, you know, I don't know. I mean, I don't think people look at things like that. Um, you know, they look at, they look at the world as if it's, you know, something that, that they're like deserving of. And, and I don't think people realize that they're not deserving of a single thing. I mean, I talked to this shirt that I'm wearing right here. It says filling empty bellies. This is my charity of choice. These guys down here in my local area, they take care of the homeless. They will give you a meal. They'll get you some clothing set up with, you know, whatever it is that help that you need to get to get moving again. And when I see like the way a lot of people will treat the homeless around here and I'm thinking, you know, they say something of like, somebody ought to do something about it. Well, these guys do. I mean, they're, they're a nonprofit. They're not doing this for anything other than trying to, to do something inside of their community. And I tell you, a lot of people don't look at that. They don't see that as part of their life. And I know that I was a hell of a lot closer to living with these guys than I am to living in the house. And, and that's, that scared me. I don't know how many people look at that. And when you start getting UBI and you start having a society that keeps people in that condition, or at least disincentivizes them, I, I don't know what we're going to get from that. I mean, it's going to, it's going to create a deterioration and a widening of inequality. Unlike anything we've ever seen. When you, when you tie that in with the whole hypergamous thing that we were talking about, could you imagine what society is going to be like in 10, 20 years? If, if that stuff unfolds like that. I really can't. Like I try to, I, I try to imagine like, cause I have, you know, I have some young kids. I have a 13 year old and a seven year old and I can't imagine by the time they're like 50, what life would be like, it, it, you know, what this whole, like, if I don't give them the chance to either, what is it? I mean, you only have two sides you're going to be on, right? Either the rich or the poor. Because that's really what I see is that we're going to have a very huge splitting of the classes. And, you know, if I don't give them the right, the right path to achieve that higher level, what are they going to get from that? I mean, what's this world going to be like for them? So it scares the shit out of me to think about what this, what this is going to be like. Honestly, I, I mean, I can't look at the world the way I want it to be. I have to look at the world the way it is and try and navigate my way through it. And it's happening. I mean, this stuff is taking place. Now, you can get mad and angry and try and, like, you know, fight it all you want. That isn't going to work. What you have to do is you have to figure out how to navigate your way around it. And, and that is, and it's almost, I hate to say it, it's not accepting it. But you can't fight it in a way that is just like, I mean, you try and live your life the way that you want the world to be. I mean, that's for sure. But to think that, you know, that you're going to fight what's happening, like you're going to be able to fight the fact that the house prices are going to become unachievable for everybody else. That's that's not going to happen. You can't fight that. Yeah. You know, I, I recently saw a, a video about Australia and how there's there's been somewhat of like money laundering going on down there. And wealthy people from all over the world have been buying up properties in Australia because of their laws and stuff. And then here we're seeing, you know, BlackRock and, you know, some big equity funds buying up residential housing here as well. So I think that's another factor that's going to be driving up housing prices. And I don't see that trend ending any, anytime soon. What are your thoughts? Um, no, I, I see that. I, I see that very same thing. Um, you know, I see it really happening here in my my local area, um, big time. And uh, you know, it was kind of funny because uh, <laughs> the my landlord's selling the house that I'm in, and I'm standing in front of my house and I'm letting my dog out, and this guy comes pulling up, and he was like, "Hey, tell me about your house here," you know, and I'm like, "Oh, great, you know, I kind of really want to talk about my house, bro." And he was like, hey, how big is the backyard, whatever? And I was just like, and he goes, when can I walk through it? And I'm like, you can just, and I'm pointing to the realtor sign, you know, and I say, you can just contact that guy right there. 
And he says to me, he goes, yeah, yeah, we're moving here from Atlanta looking to buy a house. And I said, yeah, that's too bad. <laughs> you know, and I didn't realize like I had said it so sarcastically to him until I had actually said it. And I'm like, oh, um, well, whatever, man, you know, and I just kind of backed off. But, you know, really what I see happening is a lot of outer staters and big city people who have sold their high expensive homes and they're moving to my area. And the gentrification that has taken place here is just overwhelming. Um, well, you know, it's happening everywhere. I mean, I, I live outside of New York city and, and New York city just is not what it was even two years ago. And a lot of people fled into the suburbs and, and beyond. Uh, and, and I don't see that trend to continue. I mean, not continuing because what's happening in the city with the, with the, the COVID passports and just the quality of life has gone so, so poor. Well, again, you know, food conveniences, pleasures of life, but they make it inconvenient. Where are you going to go? You know, so you're going to leave your expensive, you know, condo in the city and move out to what's now going to be a very expensive home out in the middle of nowhere. So, yeah, it's sad to see it happening. You know, I feel I like I said, I feel really bad for my kids if, you know, this kind of trend continues. What, what can we do, do you think, to prepare ourselves and, and kind of individual a better, better place? Yeah. Yeah. Learn to be the capitalist who can lend into that system and capitalize off of it. Right. I mean, that's what you know, I love it when they blame capitalism, but capitalism is awesome if you know what it is and you try and benefit from it because they're going to be there no matter what right? the capitalist is. I don't care what condition or environment or what type of government you have. There's going to be people there who can look and see where they can put their money and make the most money off of that. And, you know, that's the place you want to be. I am a terrible investor. I have tried investing and try being like a day trader kind of dude. And I've done it with stocks and cryptos and stuff. And I suck at it. I am just terrible. So I just try and look to see places where I can save my money and try to not lose it. Um, I like using silver as an insurance policy. I like to buy a little bit of silver every month just to try and keep my stack increasing. I don't really consider it like something that's going to make me rich one day, but it's definitely something there that will provide me with, you know, a payment or an emergency kind of funding or something. And since it's difficult to try and cash out, like not difficult in the sense that you can't do it, it just takes you like a good day to go down to the dealer and, and cash it all out. So it gives you a chance to really think about what it is that you're doing when you're when you're holding on to it. So I really like buying silver to protect myself. I have been dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin for one year exactly. I started October 13th last year buying $50 a week worth of Bitcoin, and it has done amazingly well. I put in like $2,600, $2,650, and I think my Bitcoin portfolio on that one is up to like $4,300 right now. So, you're a good investor. What's that? So, see, so you are a good investor. Oh, well, I, I don't know. I'm trying like, like up until, oops, up until just recently, I haven't, I have, I've done very poorly. It seems like, um, but, uh, those are kind of like, you know, and I also had like a little stock portfolio that I did right alongside of it where I did, uh, the Russell ETF, uh, 1000 growth stock. I did the, uh, it was a Vanguard ETF. I'm sorry, the Vanguard ETF, Russell 1000 growth stock. I did the uh, Vanguard total stock market. And then I did Altria, that um, Marlboro and Anheuser-Busch stock, uh, Emma. Those were, the, those were the three that I put into a portfolio. And then I did $50 purchases of those. Whatever one was at the bottom of the portfolio, I just put $50 towards that particular one. So basically, it was $50 towards the stock portfolio, $50 towards Bitcoin. The stock portfolio is up like, I don't know, 7% wow. you know, over the course of the year. And that, the Bitcoin that, is crazy up like, think, like how much the averages have like rallied over the past year, you know? It's just insane. Just insane. So, um. So when I think about like what it is that you got to do to protect yourself, you got to look at all avenues because I have no idea. Like right now, I am still a very strong dollar theorist. I just I really feel that the world demand for dollars is going to explode at some point, especially if we see things like the Evergrande condition start to like the contagion really start to, you know, infest the rest of the 
rest of the world, just not just in the development of China, but, you know, throughout many industries throughout the rest of the world, if we see that kind of contagion happening, then I can see where like dollar bonds, these junk dollar bonds start to fail. The demand for dollars to try and cover this debt is going to be huge, you know, especially like if it starts getting into some of the credit default swap kind of stuff, who knows where, where it could go. I mean, they can get really outstanding. So are you, are you saving dollars too? In yep. Yeah. Yep. I save dollars. I save silver. I save Bitcoin and I do a little bit of investing into stock portfolio. Um, I don't, I mean, I, I don't really hold a whole lot of dollars in the sense that I want to hold dollars for like a long-term future. I'm doing it because I feel that there's buying opportunities to happen. I'm also looking to buy a house, even though I am not very favorable about the condition of buying a house right now. When you have no place to live, it doesn't leave you a whole lot of options. So I'm keeping that option open, wide open, you know, for me. Um, so that's another reason why I held on to dollars for most of the time instead of in trying to invest it and make more money with it. Hey, what, um, what do you think about this tracking of bank accounts it's over $650? Um, I, I thought they had been doing that anyway. So to me, it wasn't like too concerning because I just assumed that that was already happening. Um, but I could see where that could be really like disappointing for a lot of people who have like maybe a lot of different types of accounts with just $600 in them. Yeah. I mean, that can be really annoying to try and do all the reporting of all the stuff that you haven't even really messed with. Like I have a, I have a M1 account, the stock account that I was playing around with that has about $600 in it. And I just, I don't even really mess with it. It just sits there, you know? So, I mean, I guess I have to report that as well. Oh yeah. And that paper, oh, and that them, oh, and that, you know, and like shit, you know, I'm not saying like, you know, I got all these $600 accounts over there, but it's just like, you know, shit, I got a lot of accounts. I got to make sure that if there's $600 in there, I got to report this, you know, it's just like, yeah. I don't know. It's it's a good motivation to, to buy precious metals and keep your money. Yeah, yeah, if you put it on the silver, you don't have to worry about it. You know. <laughs> so it, it's so true. Money, you know, you, you've obviously done a, a, a fair amount of reading about the central bank digital currency. Yeah. Yeah, the central bank digital currency, this is going to be ultimately what I found from the central bank digital currencies is that the real reason they want to have this central bank digital currency is so they can take interest rates into negative territory. They want to take go cashless society and they want to take interest rates negative. And it's going to be very difficult to take interest rates into negative territory if you have cash in the system. The moment that you go negative, and especially if it hits like bank deposits, like your personal savings deposits or something, that's when people will be like, oh, no, and they'll pull everything out in cash. So this is where they know that going into negative territory is going to be very difficult. It's going to be hard for the central banks to do this. Now, if you can pull the cash out of the system, then they won't have any other choice. You know, you put your money in the bank and it'll just be locked up in there. So the way that the central banks are going to deal with that is that they're going to make cash very cumbersome. They're gonna charge you a fee to withdraw and to deposit cash that's going to be equivalent to the same as the negative interest rate on your deposits. That's where I feel that the central banks are really gonna try and get the monetary system to get, that's where they want it to be. The reason for it is, is so that they can continue to drop interest rates. Right now, the dropping of interest rates is no longer an effective tool because they run into what they call the lower bound. Right. That's basically where interest rates are at zero and dropping of interest rates is no longer that effective tool. That's where the fiscal stimulus came in. That's where they were like, OK, so we're going to provide all this like QE for the government to go out and spend all this money into the economy since we can't really drop interest rates and get people to go out there and borrow money in the same sense that we used to do to fight these recessions. The next recession that comes around there, what are they going to do? I mean, more fiscal stimulus spending. So what's going to happen is, is that's where the pain is going to start setting in. This is something that a lot of people have heard me talk about. And this is where like the pain of like everybody's like the pain of a recession. I mean, everybody knows what, what they fear when a recession comes in, whether it's your job, whether it's your retirement, whatever it is, the recession is going to be the pain that people feel. Once that starts to set in, they will demand Congress do something about it. And since there's really nothing out there for the Federal Reserve to do, like they can't drop interest rates and the fiscal stimulus spending is really kind of 
difficult to deal with that on a political level. They're going to change the way the Fed is charted. Now, the Fed can't inject money directly to people. They have to go through the Treasury. This is the reason right now. Right. And they don't even have to go. They can't even go through the Treasury with it. They have to go through the primary dealers. Right. So the primary dealers are the ones who are buying the Treasuries and the Fed buys the Treasuries from the primary dealers. And then that's how the Treasury ends up with the money. What this whole central bank digital currency will do is that everything will conduct. They will conduct business as normal until there is an emergency. So like say unemployment reaches a certain level or say like, you know, GDP reaches a particular level or falls to a particular level. The treasury will have these special bonds that the federal reserve can buy. When they buy those particular bonds, instead of taking that money and handing it to the treasury, they'll inject it directly into people's wallets. And this is the way that they're going to stimulate the economy. But the only way they can do that is for the co- is for Congress to change the laws so that the Federal Reserve will have the power to actually do that kind of thing. The only way to do it is with the pain. They have to feel that pain so that the people will demand it. What does that portend for for cryptocurrency? Do you think that well, allow, do you think that they'll allow the competitiveness of crypto? I don't know, like. I don't know when it comes to cryptocurrencies, I don't know if the government has any choice in the matter of any of it. Now they can make laws saying you can't use it or that their banks can't exchange with it and stuff like that. But the program, the Bitcoin program will forever continue. I mean, I have a firm belief in that, that there is no stopping that program. Once you have made a transaction, it goes out there into the blockchain. There is no stopping it. So the government can make a lot of laws against cryptocurrencies. But something that I've kind of learned about laws and things that people want, whether it's guns or drugs or sex or anything else like that, you make a law against it and you add a lot of value. Yes. You know, so I think that's probably one of their concerns that they don't want, right, is to cause it to be even more valuable than it already is. (laughs) Unless they're getting paid off in Bitcoin. First, I'm going to get it off You know, just like a, I don't know. Do you guys know the the story of the tally sticks? No, tell us. No, please. So I don't know if I'm telling the story exactly right, but tally sticks was a form of currency from way back in like the 1600s or something. And so these tally sticks, what they would do was like a form of currency. It was the way that you could pay the king's tax. And they would take these sticks and they'd make these little marks on them and then they would split the stick in two. And half that stick would go to the treasury of the king and then the other half would go into circulation and be spent in, as, as money. And when taxes were due, the two sticks would be met up and then the can- debt would be canceled out essentially. So this was like a form of currency. And it worked for like hundreds of years. They used these dang tally sticks for currency. And then these smart bankers came in there and started doing loans and started buying up the tally sticks until they bought all the tally sticks up and there was no more currency. It was just their currency into the system. So I see something like that could possibly take place with cryptocurrencies. Like, you know, you think about it, like if all of a sudden they just became so expensive and so cumbersome to use that you had to be making like million dollar, billion dollar transactions with them in order for them to be useful you see where I'm kind of getting at, then only like the governments and the richest and the, and the most elite would ever have them. Who would think that something like that would happen? I mean, it's just an idea. I'm not saying it's going to. (laughs) What I'm saying is like that, that happens with everything, you know, like think the valuable things just go to the 1% and that's it. Yeah, it really does. And so how long do you want to be like the person who holds on to it until you can get your stock, right? You know, I mean, and so you can get your house and your car and your and your lifestyle, and then the rich end up with your with your Bitcoin and you got your your little plot, you know. <laughs> and, and that's and that's like what we were talking about before. That's happening with real estate now. Exactly. Yeah. What's happening here, James? You had a question. Um, do Do you think that uh, Do you think that crypto will be uh, will be used at some point in lieu of cash? Yes. Yeah. I think eventually cash will be out of the system. You know, I think, uh, I mean, I don't know. It's going to take a long time for that to take place. Like, I mean, I can't see it 
it won't be like in the next few years. I mean, not by any means. Cash will be in the system for a long, long time, but it's just going to become very cumbersome to use. So yes, eventually everything will switch over to a cryptocurrency and everything's going to be on blockchain. Like, Everything like right down to the very a single stick of lumber will have a spot on the blockchain and they will know where that stick of lumber is inside of the supply chain right down to the day that it gets sold. So I, I really feel that there is going to come a time in the future. Again, you know, however many years down the road that there will be nothing that you buy or get a service or anything that isn't being tokenized or on the blockchain at some point. It really sounds like a, a micromanager's wet dream. Absolutely. Oh, man. I mean, it's just for a totalitarian state, they're going to love it. You know, <laughs> they're going to be all over it. They're going to absolutely. Yeah. I mean, again, these are very fearful things for a lot of people when you think about it, like the the scariness that can come from it. I, I try not to be afraid of these things, but because you can't fight them. I mean, it's. Oh. You can, like I said, you can try and navigate your world around it, like I said, by buying up the silver, right? Again, you know, but again, you you know, it's like, it's it's a futile point, you know, to try and fight it. It's, it's not going to happen. You can't worry about this. I mean, I, I see so many in my newsfeed on YouTube that it's like panic after panic after panic with things. I mean, you, you just have to face things as you come to be strategic about it and prepare as, as best you can. Yeah. So, yeah, I see cryptocurrencies being... Like all these different ones that are out there, like the million, like 12, whatever, however, most of those are just garbage. They're not going to be doing anything, but you don't know which, you know, one, two, three percent of them that really have good, like, you know, pro like, you know, projects behind them. Like these guys really believe in their, in what they're doing. And as far as what, you know, the advancements to what, what it is that their, their, their coin is doing, I mean, there's a million of them out there that are gearing themselves for one particular direction or another. I just have a tendency to stick with, with Bitcoin and I chose Litecoin a while back just because I really like Charlie Lee and I like some of the things that he said. And I enjoyed like listening to what he said about, you know, just the advancements of blockchain and stuff. So I started investing in Bitcoin and a little bit into Litecoin and a few of the other altcoins. Um, but I believe that these things will be something huge in the future. Yeah. Quite possible. Do you have any other questions, James? No, no, I, I don't. Uh, no, I, I, you know, something. It's a. Uh, it's going to be a very complicated world, and there, there's so many different facets to to the uh, money and the economic system. You know, to to really uh, to really decipher how things are going to go is is very complicated, and you know, a lot of what you talked about tonight, you know, makes you think about you know how. You know how different uh, the direction of the country could go at any one given time. You know it's really, uh, you know, it's really disturbing to think that we don't really have any uh, any real idea in terms of the direction it's be, it's all being planned for us. I guess. Yeah, that's very true. Um, you know, I I think about that a lot. Like where. I drive an old car. Like I was talking to my kid today and he goes, how come we don't buy a nicer car? And I was just like, you want me to go get a nicer car? He's like, yeah. And I said, do you like going out to the arcade and going over to, you know, and saying all these things like, you know, he likes to do. And he was like, yeah, I said, well, we can't do that if I go buy a new car. I said, but if we drive this old beat up car, you know, then we can do all those fun things. And he was just like, and he got to thinking about it. So he started asking me about debts and stuff. I condition my life to in try and condition the boy's life and, and, everything to be as easy as possible, like as, you know, so as stress-free, I know that there's going to be a food issue coming up into the future. My wife, she works grocery. That means that I have first access to food, right? (laughs) So I got my bases covered, right? And it's not going to be like access to food. It's going to be how expensive it is. Yeah. So you have to, you have to be there, right? I also like, keep my debts as incredibly low. Like I don't want any debts at all because if things start getting into a condition where it becomes very expensive, all of a sudden you find yourself unable to, you know, make ends meet very quickly. So trying to keep my, you know, liabilities as low as possible. These are the type of things that you have to do in order to, you know, navigate into the future. That's for me. 
other people, they might have something else totally planned. Like they're going to be bugging out. So they got like, you know, a truck packed with stuff that they're like, and that's what gives them comfort. And that's how they're navigating through the future is that they have this truck packed with stuff ready to go. You know, they're ready to head into the hills. Everybody has to choose their path, you know, but understanding what it is that has taken place is probably most critical. When you're seeing the yield on the 10 year treasury rising, you have to know what cause and effects are coming from that. And if you don't know, you got to learn, you know, you got to, you got to start getting into it and figuring out why it is that mortgage rates are now going up and house prices are starting to fall. And you're, you know, <laughs> why no, did this? I, I think the majority of the world goes through life where all this stuff just is happenstance and it's just you know, like, they have no clue what's going on, you know? Well, it's, it's definitely that way. I mean, I know that was the case for me and, you know, up until 2007 and then all of a sudden here I'm losing my job and I'm losing my house and I'm trying to figure out what the hell is going on. And so I'm punching into the computer, what's up. And next thing you know, I'm reading creature from Jekyll Island and I'm listening to Ron Paul and I'm, you know, going like, man, what the hell is this freedom movement? What the hell's the fed? What's, you know, fractional reserve banking. You know, and I just like, and, I just know, everyone's so intimidated by all this stuff too uh they don't even want to look at it but but when you start like looking into it, it it's not like that complicated it's it's really not it is a lot i mean there is a lot to look at so it takes it's, it's not something that you can just pick up inside of a few weeks or months i mean it's something that you have to study on a regular basis because even if you were to fall out of things for a couple of years you can lose track of things that are happening like I mean, just trying to understand the the repo facility out of the Federal Reserve. If you were big into like banking 15 years ago, you would have no concept of the repo facility, like oh, none at all. Yeah. My, my, my point was more that like you can get to it. The average person would understand it if they I, Yeah, I barely graduated high school. I can only read for about 10 minutes before my mind just like loses track of things. I listened to to a lot of YouTube. Google has all the information in the entire world on anything that you could ever want to learn about. I, it's it's all there. And, you know, you give it a couple of hours a day, which seems like a lot. But really, once you start doing it, it, it just becomes something that you want to do. Like you want to know more about what's happening out there and you want to become more in tune. It's It blows me away when I when I talk to like people and I say, Hey man, what do you think about the debt ceiling coming up? Are you worried about that? And they're like, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, and I'm like, it's going to be pretty hard to understand what it is that you're supposed to do in life. If you don't know what well, that well, means. Let me ask it. you this about the debt ceiling time. Did, did you have any doubt at all that they were going to raise or at least accommodate it temporarily? I had zero doubt in my mind that they were, that they weren't going to raise it. Zero doubt. I mean, how many times has it been raised? Yeah, I, I don't even remember. I don't even know. Like, I, it just leads me to believe since it's been raised all that many times before that they were going to do it again. However, there is probably going to come a time where they don't. And I think that's probably part of the pain, you know, feeling thing. I think that's probably where they were going to start changing laws and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, You know, really, like, you know, the Fed has a couple of options. I mean, you know, if even if the if the if the if they were to start to default, like it's not going to be like all the treasuries that default at once. It's just going to be some, some of them, right? I mean, some of the bills will get paid, right? I mean, they are getting some revenue. And so the Fed could like do silly things like swap them out. Like here, we'll take your bad treasuries and we'll give you good treasuries. That way you're still getting paid. Or, you know, they could just do stupid rules like you know, just pretend like hey you know they're still good for your, your reserve ratios or whatever you know just like don't pretend like they're not bad you know i mean there's there's a lot of odd stuff and then of course like you know there's i don't even know if there's this is really difficult to kind of go into because i'm pretty sure the fed has emergency rules and tools that they can use that they just don't want people to know about because if they did know about it then they would rely on that as part of their investment plans but as long as you can think that the debt ceiling actually does mean something and the fed doesn't have any control over what could happen after that then they will be able to continue on with their credible threat like that that position but if the debt limit did get hit and all of a sudden the Fed popped up with these tools that they could use, then the debt limit would mean absolutely nothing after that. I mean, absolutely they're, they're always nothing. bragging that they have tools. Yeah. And right now, the debt limit is a very political, pulling, powerful thing that they can use. 
But the moment that the people believed that the Fed has tools to deal with it, then the debt ceiling would mean absolutely garbage. That's true. That's a good point. You, you know, it, it's funny that you mentioned that because my understanding is, is that the Fed can purchase. Um, they can purchase assets of any kind, I believe. So they, they the wouldn't buy ETS treasury. if they wanted to. Including the defaulted treasury. Uh, from what I understand, yeah, they can buy defaulted treasuries. Now, I don't know, like, again, I don't know the legalities behind all that. It's just something that I've read, you know, as far as like some of their options that they have. But uh, yeah, from what I understand, like if a bank is holding a defaulting treasury, like it's not paying, then they can say, well, here's one that is paying and give me that one. Right. It's just, it's just a crazy, you, uh, you know, it, and I don't know, like I, I, I still have like question about what it is that the Federal Reserve can buy as far as their assets go. Like I know that they can get the treasuries. I know they can do the mortgage backed securities. Those corporate bonds that they purchased, that was through a special purpose vehicle. It wasn't part of the Fed. It was like an entity that was separated away from the Fed that they had lent money to in conjunction with the Treasury in order to buy these corporate debts. You know, I mean, obviously, this is a tool that they can use again, but it was only during those unusual and exigent circumstances that they were allowed to use these things. I mean, that was what they used for an excuse. Are we still in those unusual and exigent circumstances in which that they can still continue to buy the corporate debt? That's I think it's a questionable action if they were to. Yeah. From what I understand, they have closed those facilities. But I, I would imagine they could open them at any time they wanted to or create new ones and just find workarounds any way they can. Well, once 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 it's happened, what the precedent's been set, you know, like it's once yeah. it's once it's once it's happened, then now yeah, I mean now it's like that's old news, you know. <laughs> that's yeah. No doubt about it. So, uh, James, do you have any other final questions for Simon? No, not at this point. No, okay. I don't. Uh, I, we, no, no. I appreciate you joining us.